live from YouTube, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and are you headed toward a life of regret? No, not today, Mr. or Miss. Today, in headlines, we're talking about how to not regret your career in 10 years. 10 years i regret my career right now today is also the anniversary of the first reported ufo sighting in the united states so maybe aliens will just come and end it all but until then today we welcome a woman who is out of this world paula pant and a man who thought ufo meant unforgivable financial offense from lenpenzo.com we welcome et Nah, it's just his look-alike, <laughs> Glenn Penzo. Joining us, of course, is also our very own little green man, Doc G. Green? <laughs> and now, a guy who's here to probe your financial life. Oh, that's uncomfortable. To learn more about your species, it's Joe Salty High. Never thought we'd have more fun with the word probe at the beginning of a oh, podcast. It's just, it's an inherently funny word. You can't not, say the word probe and not giggle a little bit. Not good. Let's probe into why that's funny, Doug. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Friday. Let me be the first one to welcome you. I'm Joe Salcihai, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And I am so happy we're going to be talking about this topic. We are diving in today to not regretting your career. And somebody who's regretted that he's been with us on this podcast the last 10 years, I'm sure it is Mr. Len Penzo. How are you, man? I'm great. And I've regretted my career. <laughs> Some of us are too old. <laughs> well, that's it's, it's, it's too late for this podcast. This podcast <laughs> is too late. <laughs> you, you, can, you can still help other people, Uncle Len. You yes, can still help other people not regret Save me. Their career. Save me somebody. Yes. And another gentleman who, by the way, talks about regret in a new book coming up and not regretting your life. The author behind the soon coming out, uh, Taking Stock, Mr. Doc G's here. Hey, it's great to be here. I'm regretting that pastrami sandwich I had for lunch, but it's, besides that, not much regret today. Don't make us regret it. No, <laughs> we don't need any stomach gurgles. And uh, how do I transition from stomach gurgles to, <laughs> I got nothing. Paula Pant joins us. Happy I, uh, Friday. Do, do not have stomach gurgles. So there's the transition. Someone, speaking of people who don't have stomach gurgles, Paula Pant. Yes, there it is. That's exactly what I should have done. I thought Joe was bad at transitions. <laughs> we even got I re even, regret that transition already. Even, even got dug on that one. Well, we got a great show. We're going to talk about not regretting your career. We got a gentleman who just retired, a guy who was a hospice doctor for a long time, and uh, Paula. So there, so there, mm -hmm. there you go. Let's get this party started. But actually, before we get the party started. With prices soaring at the pump, Discover as you're back with cash back. Use Discover to earn 5% cash back at gas stations and Target now through June on up to $1,500 in purchases when you activate. We know that every dollar matters right now, but you can count on us. Get up to $75 cash back this quarter with Discover It card. Limitations apply. Learn more at discover.com slash rewards. With the 15th pick, the Milwaukee Bucks select... You know their name. Giannis Adetokounmpo. Now, discover their journey. Papa always talks about opportunity. What if this is it? Based on the true story... Give it your all. ...of a family who risked everything... I can get you all sent back home. ...to rise together. Show them who we are. I will rise. Disney's Rise. Rated PG. Parental guidance suggested. Now streaming on Disney+. Plus. Now, let's get a move on. Today's piece comes to us from a blog called youngmoney.co. Len, I've never seen this uh, blog before. Have you seen this before today? 
Actually, didn't we already do one on this? I thought we did it. We already did one on Young Money. We, this was the second time I think we've covered a Young Money. Well, it's funny because I don't remember YoungMoney.co, but I do remember the name Jack Rain. So Jack, yeah, Jack, yeah, if, yeah. Uh, we, we've done this is the second one we've done from Jack Rain. How yeah. about that, Paula? Do you remember it? I I do not remember. Do not. I, I don't remember the website. I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember any of it. So I much. feel like I've seen that layout of a blog post and the colors and everything. So I'm going to agree with Len. That looked familiar to me. Yeah, hmm, something's going you. on. Well, maybe it's just a great piece and we're all excited that we're talking about it <laughs> because we're talking about not regretting your career today and looking back 10 years from now and going, you know what? I made some great decisions. Paula, we'll start with you. He, he mm -hmm. says in this piece, he starts off with, if you want to win the game of success, and in fact, I like the way he puts this. You've lost before you left the starting block. If you win the rat race, you're still a rat. Do you <laughs> do you agree with that sentiment? Well, I think that's an awfully judgy way to say it. <laughs> so I do not agree with that sentiment. No, but I do like he he has this analogy of this, the game of Tetris, which no surprise here. I have never played. Huh. But according to him, Tetris is a game that you cannot win. You can uh, move up, you can have increasingly more interesting challenges. Um, you can have, you know, various levels of success, but you can never actually, according to him, win the game of Tetris. Again, I've never played it. So I'm taking his word for it on that. And I think that that's a good analogy when you think about your career. Like oftentimes people might set out at the beginning of their career to be quote unquote successful, but the definition of success is a moving goalpost and it's relative to where you currently are. And based on your values, goals, priorities at a given moment in your life, your definition of success is going to be in flux. So don't make the mistake of believing that how you define success at the age of 22 or 25 or 30 or 40 or 50 will be how you define success 10, 20, 30 years down the road. But Len, does it, does it have to be a moving goalpost? I mean, or, or is that just the nature of being human that every time we get a raise of promotion, we're always looking at the next one going, maybe the grass will be greener when I get the next thing. You know, I, I guess it's um, life is a long river. It's a long journey and there's lots of stops along the way and there's lots of destinations that you should be planning for along the way. I guess you can call those your goals. One thing I will say is in response to your question, Joe, is, is that I got to a point about 10, 12 years ago where I did not want to go up any higher on the, la on the corporate ladder because I looked at the people who were above me in those positions and I didn't want to be there. And I recognized it because it was too much. It, it would have asked too much of me. And so I said, you know what? I'm happy where I'm at. I'm going to stay where I'm at because I enjoy what I'm doing. And I made a conscious decision to stay where I was at and just do the best I could in my current position. So there did come a point where I realized, you know, you don't have to go all the way to the top. You know, there's a place where you can be in your job and be happy and thrive. You know, there's a couple of uh, chemical reactions that happen in our brain when we achieve different things. We get a dopamine hit, right? We get that. There's also the serotonin rush that we can get. Did you feel this this uh, lack of, I mean, did you feel a little lost at first, Len, when you decided, you know what, I'm, I'm moving off the corporate ladder? Did that feel bad at all that you're no longer going to get those dopamine hits anymore of, hey, I achieved the next rank up? Well, no, I, what I did is I shifted where I got my dopamine hits from. So instead of the dopamine hits coming from, uh, okay, I'm another rung up the corporate ladder. It was the job I was responsible for. I had projects that had to be completed. And that's why I was deriving my dopamine hits from the successful completion of those long-term projects, you know, with short, short goals in between. That's where I was getting my dopamine hits. I, the, I didn't need to get I, dopamine hits from moving up the corporate ladder. The pride further. in doing the thing. I am Correct. really proud. I just got to say, guys, I am really proud of all four or five of us because we let Len go all the way through dopamine <laughs> hits and not a single one of us made a joke about some dude standing on a corner that he had to meet at like, you know, <laughs> to get his, get his <laughs> dopamine, get his dopamine, dopamine Thank hits. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> I mean, we are really maturing as a show. I, Good job, everybody. I'm so happy you brought up how much we're maturing <laughs> as, a, <laughs> as a show and focused in on the fact that we didn't do that at all. We would never do that. We wouldn't even go there. Uh, he very bluntly in this piece, Doc G says that uh, status 
is a lie. So going from what Paula talked about and what Len talked about, that the ladder is a lie and status is a lie. And you're going to regret your career if you go down that ladder. True or false? I mean, I think it's mostly true. The problem with status is, as we were talking about, it's never enough. And you get on a treadmill of achieving a certain status or a certain promotion or even a certain raise. And you're happy with it all of a moment. And then you're happy no longer. And I think there's a few reasons. One is because deep down inside, defining kind of our meaning and purpose by these status changes There's no real there there, right? There's other deeper things we ultimately have to start looking for to find happiness. The other thing is loss aversion. I think when you are fighting to get to this goal, this thing that's really important to you, once you get there, instead of being happy or content, usually you're immediately afraid you're going to lose whatever status you have. And so the next thing to do is to start marching farther and farther up or trying to make more and more money. So I think in a sense, yes, some of this kind of status climbing is a sham because ultimately I don't think it's truly what makes us happy. It's just low hanging fruit. It's really easy to focus on these status changes and think that that's what life is really about. Yeah. But I wonder just based on what all of you are saying, Paula, let's talk about something, you know, a ton about, which is pro sports. I know you follow <laughs> pro sports very, very closely. It's Absolutely. your, yeah, but, but, but people like people like Tom Brady, Uh, Mm -hmm. who you may or may not know, a guy named LeBron James, also you may or may Mm -hmm. not know. I mean, these people, you see them always going up the ladder. Tom Brady retired for a second and then Mm unretired because he wants to go win another Super Bowl, chasing this status thing that Jack says in this piece is, is, is not the right way to go. I mean, is, should we call Tom Brady and tell him he's doing it wrong? Well, first, we don't know his motivations. So we don't know if the reason that he unretired is because he's chasing status or because he enjoys the challenge of competition. He enjoys the the focus that comes from having a clearly defined goal with a with a very specific date and a you know very tangible, measurable outcome, like winning the Super Bowl, right? Like there there are many ways that a person could inherently enjoy the work itself. He and just wants some peace and quiet to get out of the house. And he's got kids. Yeah. And a lot. I, mean, I was going to say Gisela wanted him out of the house. Yeah, us mortals, we usually just go spend an hour in the bathroom. <laughs> Tom has a whole pro career to, go yeah. through to get out of the house. So I guess the broader point is that from the outside looking in, there might be two people who perform the exact same actions. And so from the outside looking in, it might seem as though both of them are chasing status but one might be motivated by status or ego while the other might be motivated by the intrinsic love of the work. You've got a book coming out. I don't know if you know this or not, Dr. You got a book coming out, but you do. (laughs) Yes. Wow. Be the first to congrat. You better get writing because it's uh, supposedly coming out very soon here. Uh, But you talk about people taking stock of their life and at the end of their life. And, and, and I think a lot of this has to do with not regretting the decisions that you made. Like, how do we, how do we start to transition from, I'm just going to chase this ladder to nowhere into something that we look back on and we're happy with? Well, I think we have to really start concentrating on these ideas of identity and purpose and connections way earlier in our careers And I'll give you a simple way of doing that. I'm a hospice doctor, so I deal with people who are dying all the time. And one thing I consistently hear from people dying is at some point, they'll start looking back at their life and doing what we call life review. And they'll say, I really regret that I never had the energy, courage, or time to do, you know, dot, dot, dot. And there's always something that comes after that. And that's a good concept to frame this idea of what's really meaningful to us and and what gives us a sense of purpose. The problem is sometimes we chase things like status or our career path or money and forget that those things are kind of easy to define, but don't necessarily meet that sense of meaning and purpose. So in a sense, we're spending our time doing those things as opposed to some of the things that might really be more meaningful to us or might be more important, especially as we get older and find that we have less time than we thought. Are you with Doc, Len, that you early in your career should really think about meaning and purpose early and often? Yeah, absolutely. But you know what? It's hard when you're younger. It's really hard 
it's just life is so different when you're younger. I mean, you just think you've got forever and time goes forever. But as you get older, as, as I'm learning. But I think you know, it's also looking- hard from a different way, Len. I think it's hard when you're just broke and you're thinking about the next paycheck and you're like, I'd love to think about my meaning and purpose, but I don't have any money. Like I just have to get a paycheck. Like I remember thinking that, that if I can just get beyond the next damn paycheck so I can think, so I can actually start to plan, like that's what I'm pushing for. I was never really in that position ever. So I can't relate to that, but I, it makes total sense to me. But as I'm seeing it, I know we're focused around money, but really the grand scheme of things, there's a lot of other things in life that as I get older, I'm realizing, you know, it's not all about the money. It, it really isn't all about the Benjamins. There's so much more on the human side that, that I'm still figuring out mistakes I've been making and I'm trying to change. What are the, looking back on your career, Len, what are some of the things that you regret that you wish that you'd done differently? I would imagine, you know, you've been retired a whole week, so you've been thinking a lot about, yeah. about the uh, last. Uh, well, I, I, one thing I can tell you right now that I wish I said no more to my work. There were certain, I was just, I'm talking to uh, the, the honeybee about this just the other day. It's like, I missed a couple of kids' birthdays. I missed a couple of my birthdays because I had to go travel for work and I did not tell my boss no. And you know what, looking back, it's like, why did I do that? You know, it's really, those are things you don't get back in time. And um, I was so focused on doing, you know, the job that I should have been able to tell my boss, you know what, let's postpone that meeting for a week or let's, you know, let, let, you know, I've got personal things that I need to do and I didn't. And so those are kind of, those kind of personal things are what I regret. We're hanging out, making the show on YouTube all summer long. If you want to join us for the recordings, we record Friday shows on Monday at 5 p.m. Eastern. Do the math on where you're at. Carlos, hello. Amanda, hello. And uh, James here. James says he agrees with the wizard. Who is the wizard? Yeah, who's the wizard? Does he? So it, was definitely Len. Weird? Is he Look calling Len, Len the beard, wizard because yeah, of the long yeah, beard? Oh, sure. yes. Yeah, sure. that makes yeah, sense. Very that good. makes sense. I see He's it. He's talking about dopamine hits. It's all very psychedelic. <laughs> you know, I, I'm... In the last, I'll say, six to eight Fridays, we had a slightly different show where we talked about your finding your purpose in life. And we got very, the group of us got very esoteric about that. And I think one of the places we landed, at least a couple of us, and I think Len and I were on the same page on this, not that we all had to agree. It's no fun if we all agree, but was that maybe you don't find your purpose in your job that generates a paycheck. Maybe your purpose is outside of that. So here we're talking about how not to regret your career in 10 years. One perspective or one approach to that is don't try to find your life satisfaction in your career. You you guys, and what made me think of this, Joe, is you were saying when you're young, you don't have any money and you're thinking, I need the money, but gosh, should I also be doing something that makes me feel like I'm, you know, somehow serving the, the world at large, a greater good. And that's a, tall order. Maybe what you ought to do is, is to not regret your career is whatever your career is, that's funding the other stuff you want to get satisfaction from, whether it's your, you know, in your personal life or some volunteer work you're doing anything else, maybe that's your purpose. And it's not about your career. Like you you may not regret it because as long as it's not compromising your ideals and your morals and your scruples, it's paying the bills. And you're able to go do all those other things where you really find satisfaction and fulfillment And you don't have to even really put the two together in the same equation other than one is helping fund the other. Yeah, Doug, I I actually agree with that 100%. I think the problem is that we're not intentional about purpose so that we can make those trade-offs based on a rational understanding of what's important to us. You know, in the book, I argue actually there are three kind of general ways to financial independence, and only one actually is called the passion play which is much more working at something you love. I think there are other paths to financial security in which you do exactly that. You understand that work can be a tool to make more money, which is another tool, which then can be used to accomplish some of your goals. I don't want to dive more into that in the second half, but just to round off this first half, uh, Doc G., from your career, I know you and I have had this discussion. There's things, especially from early in your career, that you regret. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, part of the work of becoming financially independent and also writing this book is I realized that I was so unaware of what my true meaning and purpose were. I thought that being a doctor was my purpose. 
It was only after I had enough money to start whittling away the things that I didn't like in my career because I was so burned out that I was left with the one thing that still felt good about my job, which was being a hospice doctor. If I had been more aware of this idea of meaning and purpose, I probably could have started my career as a hospice doctor. I probably would have never burned out. I might have made a lot less money, but then I might have had a 40, 50 year career and could have retired when I got to the end of that incredibly impactful career for me. And got more into the projects like Lem was talking about and less into making great money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Paula, how about you? Now, I know you've won a Lifetime Achievement Award. You've had a long, <laughs> fulfilling career. <laughs> for, uh, for, the, for anyone who's, who is wondering about that, yes, it's true. I won a Lifetime Achievement Award at the age of 33, which I'm pretty sure is a very cloaked way of everyone telling me, <laughs> get out. <laughs> Grandma. We're going to, we're going to start calling her grandma, Len. You may have oversaturated the market, Paula. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but what was your question, Joe? About, about, about regrets. <laughs> about, <laughs> do you regret winning a Lifetime Achievement Award? I, I got very lucky in that I chose my career in initially out of college. I started writing for a newspaper and What's I chose, that? I know, right. <laughs> to anyone who's listening, who's under the age of 25, a newspaper is. Grandma's teaching um, us about newspapers now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a print newspaper and you open it at the, above the fold. There's column inches. Wow. No, um, yeah, all kinds of jargon. Uh, so I went into the world of newspapers. Nobody goes into newspaper reporting for the money. It's not the type of thing that you go into for, for that, right? So I chose that field because I thought it was interesting. I thought that I would be skilled at it and it would be fun and it would, you know, and, and the reality of it, the day-to-day -day of it was pretty good. You know, it wasn't exactly what I thought it would be, but I actually, I really enjoyed the work, but it became obvious to me that there was not going to be a future in print newspapers. And so I pivoted and uh, created my own platform online you know, no, understanding that the future of media was going to be independent and digital. And I got lucky in that there was not a trade-off between, ultimately over time, there was not a trade-off between doing what I loved and doing the thing that would be lucrative. On the contrary, building my own business turned out to be far more lucrative than what I could have earned as a W-2 employee. So for me, the, you know, people often pit do what you love or make money as opposites. Um, as though they're mutually exclusive. And I got lucky in that mine became a perfect Venn diagram overlap. We're going to end it right there. When we pick this back up after this next segment, we're going to talk about what Doug alluded to at the beginning there. How do we actually get that Venn diagram that Paul is talking about? We're going to talk about an idea that's presented in the piece about working backward, about inverting things. Is that kind of how we start? How do we start down this path? But before we get there, at the halfway point in every show here on Stacking Benjamins on Friday, we do a trivia question where we have our three main contributors pitted head to head in an epic fight to the end of the year <laughs> <laughs> and, and to win, to win. Uh, you guys have heard of the Hunger Games right? <laughs> We're changing things up this year. That's, that's right. First place you, uh, you get to stay alive. Uh, the, <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we have this epic trophy that OG has from winning last year and, uh, doc G you're playing on behalf of OG today. So OG Paula and Len are the three contributors in this game. Uh, doc, you want the good news or bad news about where you sit? Well, this is me and the trivia segment, so it's all bad news, regardless. <laughs> it's bad news for bad news for uh, for OG. For least, OG. Yeah. Doc G has a well earned reputation by usually missing by a few million, even if the real answer is twelve. Uh, <laughs> on, a, on a good day, yes. Yes. Day. Uh, OG and Paul over the past couple of weeks have been kind of reeling Len in a little bit. Len has nine. OG has seven and a half. Paula with six and a half with her big win last week could tie OG for second, uh, which is a nice way to say tie for last. But uh, all right, Doug, you ready for this week's trivia question? Let's do it. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Okay, what is the deal with aliens? For real. I like how the government was all like, uh, oh yeah, we forgot to tell you, they're real. And life on Earth 
have gotten so crazy that we're all collectively like, yeah, what ifs? That's not even the craziest thing I've heard this week. <laughs> I mean, here, here, here's an example. I thought I bumped into an alien last Tuesday at the Easy Mart. Turns out it was just Joe's mom after a chemical peel. <laughs> have you heard about aliens and cows? Like, what is the deal with aliens and cows? Aliens were blamed for doing all kinds of weird things to cows in the 70s. But I mean, like, really, who was it? doing weird stuff in the 70s. In 2009, according to Mental Floss, a rancher in Colorado connected strange lights in the sky with the death of one of his cows. And you know how much the price of beef has gone up? That rancher must have been pissed at those aliens. Here on Earth, there's this rumor that climate change isn't only because of all those aliens driving up the price of jet fuel, it's also because of cow farts. But just like I'm always falsely accused of crop dusting here in the basement, cows are maligned because, and I keep telling the guys this about me, what's really the culprit is their breath. It's called enteric fermentation, basically the digestive process of animals with multiple stomachs. Again, just like me, something else I've got in common with cows. So here's my question. You guys awake now? Here's my question. What percentage of total methane emissions are contributed through cow burps. I'll be back with the answer after I go put a mask over the cow we keep in the corner of the basement. We call it our cow -ch. Our, our couch. That's what we, we we call it the couch. Come on, Doc. Come on. Is it a leather couch? Come on, I even got Paula to laugh I'm, on that one. I'm still trying to figure out the question. <laughs> what percentage of methane emissions are contributed by cows burping the alphabet? So not farting, just burping. No, because that's a myth. It's not their farts. I was thinking- Most of it is coming from their farts. Yeah, most of it comes from their breath, uh, actually. Their breath. Yeah. So here's the, uh, I didn't think we were going to have a question this week, Doug. I thought you were just on a cow. <laughs> cow there was so much information I had rant. in there. I thought that's what we were doing today. But, all right, that means, uh, Mr. Penzo, you're going first. Emissions in cows- well, I don't want to milk this for too long because <laughs> <it's>, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so well I have no idea. It's a percentage, oh, right? So, it's so okay. So that makes it. It's got to be somewhere between one, right? You want a percentage, so it's got to be I do. obviously between one and a hundred. Uh, oh, I can't believe this. It is, could be one in is, a thousand, Len. <laughs> I've heard people say a thousand percent, right? Okay. Well, then you hear that, Doug? That's probably good advice. I mean, I missed I that doc. math class. Doc, that's good yeah, advice, yeah. Doc. <laughs> that would have been my answer, yeah. Okay. That would have been Doc's um, answer. This puts me in the, on the horns of a dilemma because... <laughs> it just keeps getting better. <laughs> it just keeps getting but better. But seriously, I got to be careful here because I think the number's low, but that really makes it vulnerable for me to not have a... If I'm wrong, I am really has no have no chance this week. But I still think it's low. Uh, I'm going to say, my goodness, oh, this is crazy. I'm going to say 7%. 7%. An utterly low answer. <laughs> keep it going. I'm just keep trying it going, to keep up, people. man. Just trying to keep up. Uh, that wait. means, uh, Doc G, you're up next. So I think he's too low and I'm just excited because between one and a hundred, I can only be off by so much. That's right. That's right. I think it's higher. And so I got to, I got to go a number high enough that Paula's going to have trouble Chelsea Brennaning me. So I'm going to have to go with 35%, I think. 35%. Well, Paula, there's a conundrum. Right. So it's clear that Len chose seven because he wanted to choose a number that was low enough that it would discourage me <laughs> from Chelsea Brennaning him on the downside, right? Because if I chose six, then the range of possible answers that would be accurate, that, that would be correct if I were to choose the number six, you know, that it's a very narrow range. So Len chose seven in order to discourage me from Chelsea Brennaning him on the downside. You'd roughly have a six it, 100 shot. Yeah. It's not that Paul is vain. It's just that she figures everybody else is really focused only on her and how she's going <laughs> to get. That's all we've been thinking. We're just wondering, just like your question, if she is going to guess. That's what we're... <laughs> 
Well, I, I mean, my answer is going to be either six or eight. It's just to do oh, I, do Paula. I, of course, of course. <laughs> now you Chelsea Brennan me last week and that cost yeah. me. You got sandwiched <laughs> last week. Yeah, it was bad last Does week. Does it help you, Paula, if my gut says go with eight, maybe then you go with the opposite? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Let's see. And the question is percentage of total methane emissions emitted through cow burps, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, more or less. Jeez. Okay. I know that cows do have quite a reputation for their I'll, contribution to the methane problem. Paul, I'll pay you $10 to Chelsea Brennan Doc. <laughs> <laughs> could, be, could be a side that hustle 10 bucks here, is Paula. worth more than the trophy, Paula. <laughs> you could buy your own trophy. I'm, I'm going to go with eight. I'm going to go with eight. Goes with you eight. Rascal. I knew she you was rascal. All right. Well, we'd love to tell you. Now that all all bets are locked in, who's right? We don't play that way, though. We'll be right back. This Pride, everyone's coming through for the Trevor Project on YouTube Shorts. Join us. Create a short showing how you're stepping up for Pride using the hashtag YouTube Pride Challenge. Come through for Pride on YouTube Shorts. Visit YouTube.com backslash Pride. We're all juggling life, a career, and trying to build a little bit of wealth. The Brown Ambition Podcast with host Mandy and Tiffany the Budget Nista can help. If you guys have listened with us from the beginning, I mean, we were just like two single girls when we started off. You've seen us get married. You see Mandy have her beautiful baby. It's like this living diary. I know. When and are so... we ever going to have time to sit down and listen to 300 hours of our lives? <laughs> I don't know, yeah, but it's out there at least. Brown Ambition. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Len Penzo, you kicked it off with seven. Seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, I'm screwed. Doc G, nobody went nearly as high as you. What? What is your number? Uh, Three thousand. Thirty-five. Thirty. Only thirty-five. <laughs> sorry. All, all I can say. All I can say is Len is screwed. I'm so used to your guest being six million um, <laughs> that uh, I'm kind of shocked. And Paula, you've got eight. How are you feeling? Well, now that both Len and Doc G have said that Len is screwed, I think the answer is going to be like four. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's the way it's worked most of the time when you feel confident, Paula. Exactly. All right, Doug. Exactly. Doug's got the answer. Let's see who's going to win this one. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm back. According to a little boutique ag producer called Cargill, one surprising solution to the methane issue is seaweed. It's been found that seaweed can provide all of the nutrients without the climate change burps. Let me know if you get lost in this scientific jargon, by the way. A different type of red seaweed has been found to reduce methane emissions by 95%. And that's good because... You know what percentage of total methane emissions are contributed by the digestive process of animals? 27%. That means Doc G is our winner. No. What the hell's going on? What my is going on? My attempts to thwart OG have failed miserably. <laughs> what is going on? I you know, know, Paula Paula could have had 10 bucks and one. She would have won. <laughs> And ten dollars <laughs> could have had the side right. gig, Paula. You let it go, and once again, you felt confident. But you were on the right side of seven. You were on the right That's side of seven. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Just not, just not close enough. And uh, that means, oh, gee, now eight and a half, only half a point, Len, behind you. We'll see. Hey, it's hard to go first. We'll see next week where how this <laughs> continues. So much excitement. <laughs> Best part of the song is hearing uh, Doc G kind of hum along with it. Uh, it's my favorite. Uh, 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 uh. Second half of today's discussion brought to you by Magnify Money. You know what happens, uh, Doc G, when you go to stackybedjamins.com slash Magnify Money? You find that brick and mortar banks come nowhere near best in class. Oh, Offer products that come nowhere near best in class. Over 92% of them, in fact, that all the things online ranked head to head at Magnify Money. Go to stackybedjamins.com slash Magnify Money for more. I like that. We we actually tag team that one. That was great. <laughs> it only took me like 10 times being on the show to actually remember the answer to that. So much better than when I ask Len, who's been on the show for 10 years. He's like, I don't know. I don't have any idea. No clue. Hey, Joe. 
I have a beef with that joke. A real beef with that joke. Uh, <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Earlier when you said you got sandwiched, I almost cracked a beef sandwich joke, but I refrained. <laughs> what is it? What is it? Is it maybe like a steak sandwich? Yes, like a or a roast beef? beef sandwich. A roast beef sandwich. <laughs> yes. Or a hamburger. Mm, with a little deli sauce and some Swiss. That's a fine Sammy. Where does the roast beef sandwich end? Isn't that the most expensive one on your survey? Leonard's at BLT. BLT is the uh, most expensive. No, it's the BLT, but only once has something surpassed the BLT, and I believe it was the roast beef sandwich. Only and, once. And for people that don't know, every year, if you're new to the show, uh, Len every year has this really cool way of looking at inflation where he looks at the price of making sandwiches. And uh, we've got that coming up in early August again. I'm sure you're you're deep in the weeds getting all the data together right now. This is going to be a wild year. I can't imagine. Very seriously, I can't imagine what's happened to the price of a sandwich this year with all this thought about inflation. Nobody ever thinks about inflation. And right now, it's... Uh, on everybody's everybody's mind, but not on our mind right now. We're transitioning to the second half of this discussion. And uh, Doug hit the nail on the head. Maybe we should be thinking about other things. You know, it's funny, Doug, when you were talking earlier about what we should be focusing on. We were uh, in, in this uh, group that I'm a part of called Strategic Coach. My coach at our last meeting said, he said that there's a difference between your vision and what your goals are. And, and your goals are going to be time-based, right? Smart goals are going to be time-based. They're going to have, you're going to know if you reach them or not, and you're going to cross the line with them. But your vision is much more beyond your business. It's beyond your career. And he said, what is your vision beyond your career for yourself? I mean, t- think about thinking, but first time in my life, I'm 54 years old. I'm like, beyond my career, what is my vision? Like, holy cow. But Paula, does that kind of nail it? Is it really thinking bigger than your career, bigger than what you're doing the nine to five? Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, your career is one element of your overall life. And certainly it's it's a major defining element, but it is one and only one element of the vision, the big picture vision of the type of life that you want to create. So I completely relate to that concept that visions are not goals. A vision is big picture. It's broad. You know, whereas a goal is, as you said, time bound, specific, measurable. Uh, So start with the vision to quote you quoting Stephen Covey, start with the end in mind. Yeah. Yeah. But and Len, I'm wondering when it comes to the thoughts that you had about your career, when you messed up, like not telling the boss, no, like, I feel like working from a vision, right? Working from this is what my whole life is and not just my career might give you the perspective to be able to say no more easily. Yeah, I, that would help if you're, like I said, when you're younger, it's kind of harder to to want to do that. But yes, if you can do that, I, you would greatly benefit. Try and take a look at the whole picture. Understand there's, there is more to life than just the career. You know, it's a big world out there. There's a lot uh, and there's a lot of impacts that we can all make outside of career. So yeah, it, it's hard. It's hard to take a look at all that stuff. And it, it really is. It's easier said than done. Well, and that's what I'm thinking about. You know, I'm sitting here thinking, what is my big picture vision? Holy cow, that's a big question, right? That's a huge question to ask myself. And Jack, in this piece, the author of the piece that we're kind of riffing on today for our inspiration, uh, he quotes Charlie Munger. Charlie Munger, of course, the fantastic investor. Charlie Munger uses the term invert. He says, turn a situation or problem upside down. Look at it backwards. What happens if all our plans go wrong? Where don't we want to go and how do we get there? And so what he says, what Jack says in the piece, the corollary here is to ask ourselves maybe an easier question, Doc G, what don't I want? Like maybe we just start with what, what am I sure I do not want to have happen in my life? Is that a easier path? I don't buy into that at all. There is a place for asking what I don't want, but usually the better question is what do I want more so that I can decrease what I don't want and fill it up with things that I do want. So I completely disagree. I think you have to really do some of that purpose and identity work earlier on so that you can figure what actually fulfills that sense and what doesn't. Now, again, that doesn't mean you that you leave your career, your job right away. This is all about trade-offs. And some sometimes the trade-off is I do need to make money and that's okay. 
But in my well, your opinion, career, wh- your career can also be a part of that vision. Like Paula was saying oh, earlier, oh, that there can be a for sh- synergy for between sure. them. I mean, I had the modeling of two parents who love their jobs, but something happened when they got more and more financially well off. They just started subtracting out things from the job they didn't like. So every bit of friction, every client they didn't like every project that was no longer, you know, fulfilling a sense of meaning and purpose, eventually they were able to get rid of it. So I do agree in the sense that once you have a better idea of what you think meaning and purpose are, then you can start subtracting out those things you don't like. But to indiscriminately get rid of what you don't like first is still going to leave a little bit of vacuum until you do find what is important to you. Paula, you also disagree with Jack and Charlie Munger? Well, I I think that they're... uh just different frameworks, different approaches for, for coming at the problem. You know, certainly defining what you don't like is necessary, but not sufficient. And similarly, identifying the trade-offs, identifying that you, you want X and you want Y, but which of those two do you want more, right? Which of those two of the things you want, are you willing to trade off because one of them is higher ranked than the other in terms of desires, values, principles, vision, Right. I think both of those exercises are needed. Is that what you're getting at, Doc G? Are you getting at like Tinder your goals? You, you take <laughs> you swipe left or swipe right on your different goals. Well, here's the way I look at it. Like we have a set amount of time on this earth. We don't know. We could die at 50. We could die at 80. We don't know. But each of us probably has a set amount of time and we can't commoditize that time. We can't buy it. We can't sell it. We, the only thing we can really do is really decide what activities to place in those time slots. So our goal as human beings, I believe, is to fill as many of those time slots with things that are meaningful to us and get rid of filling those time slots with things that we don't like. So however we find a way to juggle that best to optimize those spaces so they're they're filled with things that we want to be doing, the better. I don't know if it's that kind of tinderization of swipe left, swipe right. I think it's a matter of of deciding what the trade-offs are of doing the activities we do on a daily basis and trying to be very intentional about those. Doc, I I think you're right on. And here's kind of the irony of the thing is, you know, as you're, when you're younger, you don't know a lot of times you don't really know what your calling is or what gives you purpose. It could take a decade or more to figure it out. When you're filling those boxes, as Doc's talked about, um, you're going to find out the things you like and the things you don't like. But that takes time. That takes part of your life experience. You're going to burn some years filling those boxes, figuring out what, what are the negatives and what are the things, the things you don't like and the things you do like. And then going back to the money issue, money is ultimately money. Here's where the money does come in. Money is freedom. The more money you have, the more freedom you have. So sometimes you, you're going to have to sit through that job you might not like for a little while to get that money that you need that will give you the freedom to walk away from the boxes that you've discovered that you don't like and you can pursue the boxes of the things that you do like that might not pay money. Is that does that kind of make sense there? Yeah. You know, one point I just want to make though is you said it takes time and it may take decades. Well, I work with dying people on a regular basis and I'll tell you right now, most people actually never start thinking about meaning and purpose. And the reason is it's really hard. Yeah. And so this is the issue is that people just don't do it. We need to start doing this way earlier. And I think, you know, my theory on why people don't do it is because it's scary. I mean, to come to terms with the fact that there are these really important things in life and you need to start assessing them and thinking about them is also to come to terms with the fact that life is finite. You might never be there. And one day you're going to die. And people don't like doing that. You know what, Doc, let me just, the old guy, one more time. I just got to say this, Mm -hmm. and I sound like a broken record. When you're younger, though, it's hard to see that. I mean, you just got so much life ahead of you. And it's really, as you get older, only does that, at least for me, it didn't really come into focus till I got older. And I'm going, geez, I've, um, that toilet paper roll, you know, how it unwinds faster and faster, the older you get. Right. So, so, uh, you know, I'm at that point now where the toilet paper roll is really spinning fast. Yeah. <laughs> Have you so seen that- a gastroenterologist recently, Len? <laughs> there may be a solution there. Oh, the toilet paper of life analogy. <laughs> Gets me just every remember, time. Just, just remember that. Eye. That toilet paper roll may run out really fast. No, my dad died at 40. So if you put off thinking about some of these things, you may miss out 
on considering meaning and purpose and then may pass away, unfortunately, way earlier than you thought. And that, well, that's one of the tragedies yeah. that I see on a regular basis. I, I wonder if I, and Joe, feel free to edit this out later as you do with most of my content, but, um, (laughs) (laughs) oh, that made Paula laugh. I've been trying to get her to laugh the whole episode and that's what got her. Anyway, uh, just so you know, Paula, you are my litmus test, uh, in every episode, but anyway, uh, do you think that the reason doc that people put that off and never do it is because we feel like we get one shot at picking what our purpose is and it must be, it should be something, this huge lofty broad impact kind of purpose. That's going to have this positive impact on everybody's lives. Could we a start a lot simpler, something that is, you know, my purpose is just to have a great family or to volunteer my time at a local shelter or something like that. And then realize we get to revise it. We get to change our vision. We get to change our purpose five years later, two years later, we don't get just, but I think it's almost like, I want to write a book. I'm a good writer. I want, but I, what do I say? I don't have a message I'm trying to deliver. So you never do anything. I think there's another piece. Well, I think there's another piece of that, Doug. I feel like, and this is my regret is that when you start walking down one path, you have this piece of you that feels like you're closing other paths and it isn't the fear walking down one. It's the fear that I might not get the other five. And so you do nothing because of the fact that you're trying to, Make sure you keep all your options open. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing that says your purpose is set in stone. I mean, purpose can oh, be Doug's something is. at Doug's is. What was that? Doug's, Doug's is. is. It is I locked mean, in. Purpose can be something as big as solving climate change, or it can be something as small as learning martial arts. I mean, it can be short term or it can be a long term life goal. Again, in my opinion, the only requirement for purpose for me is that if I was sitting there on my deathbed bemoaning my life, I would complain that I didn't have the energy, courage, or time to pursue whatever that thing is, that kind of stuff that comes up. And that can be small. That can be fixing a relationship that went awry. I mean, that can be making a trip to a place that had some type of significance to you. And you can graduate from one purpose and go to another. It's actually quite magical. I think the opportunities are out there and, and I don't think we should limit ourselves to feeling that purpose is this one thing that has to be huge and it has to be our life's work, so to speak. I guess it's a great place for us to lock this in. I love the idea that it's not about the Benjamins as much as it's about finding what you value and uh, focusing on that. Let's talk about what each of you guys are doing as we get ready to say goodbye to this episode this week. What a, what a great discussion. Doc G is our guest of honor. We'll have you go last. Mr. Penzo, you are in the spotlight first, my friend. What's going on at lempenzo.com? Oh, I had a little fun this week. I jotted down the 10 things I love the most about credit cards and the 10 things I hate the most about my credit cards. And I put them all in one spot. I thought it was going to be lempenzo.com. The 10 things you love most about credit cards. And then you sent it to Mr. Ramsey. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. You should. You should tweet it to him. The 10 things I like about credit cards. Dave, you agree with number six? No? Um, I don't know. You know, I'd rather send him my thing on, that I, I wrote about his snowball, debt snowball method and why I hated that so much. So oh, man. There's a topic for the future. Debt snowball method controversy. We're going to have people, money geeks, up in arms all over the place. Oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Paula Pant, what's going on at the Afford Anything podcast? On the Afford Anything podcast, Columbia University professor Dr. Michael Slepian talks about the psychology of secrets. All of us have secrets, and many of them are related to, on this conversation around career. Many of them are related to career ambitions that we have or plans to change careers or to quit our jobs or to retire early or to start our own business, right? There are these things that we don't share with our bosses or our colleagues or our clients. And similarly, there are many things that we don't share about finances and money. And so the psychology of secrecy, the way that it affects us, uh, the way that it affects us internally, as well as our relationships, that's what we discuss on the Afford Anything podcast available wherever finer podcasts are downloaded. I thought you were going to say that you'd tell us what it was about, what you talked about, oh, but it's a secret. So you, that would be good. You can't, can't do it. Jeez. 
I'd tell you what this episode is about, but, but she, you know, Paula did that so smoothly. I was going to say she really butchered it, but uh, I just decided not to. <laughs> Back to utterly butchered it. <laughs> is that kind of a cheesy comment? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's just now I'm butchering it. Save us, Doc G. Thanks for joining us again, man. And I'm so proud of you, my friend. Not only it's like the grasshoppers growing up, just you, <laughs> you not only didn't miss it by a million, but you actually won today's trivia. And, um, I'm just very proud. Yeah, it, I'm so excited. I, I, I might be speechless at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't be because you got to tell us what's going on at Earn and Invest podcast. Earn and Invest this Monday. We had an episode with Patience Marame Ball and Dr. Ruth Shaber. They are the writers of the XX Edge and they tell us why investing in women is good business. It's an amazing episode, an amazing book, chock full of figures and logic about why having women involved in business decisions, having them part of board of directors, having them as financial advisors actually creates more wealth in our world. So it's a fascinating discussion. And uh, I hope y'all take a listen. Another deeper dive on the earn and invest podcast and, uh, also available where finer podcasts are distributed. All right. That's going to do it for today. Thanks for joining us, everybody. By the way, if you are in Phoenix, I'm in Phoenix tonight at uh, Barnes and Noble, come see us. And then on Sunday, I'll be at uh, the Barnes and Noble in Summerlin, just outside of uh, Las Vegas. So we'll see you guys Friday and Sunday as we finally wrap up this book tour. Unbelievable. So the last two stops, we got to throw down Phoenix and Vegas. We got to make this a big old party. All right. That's going to do it. Doug, it's up to you, man. What should we have learned today? Well, Joe, first to prevent regretting your career, find your hell yeah and go all in. Second, your vision and goals don't have to change the world. They don't even have to be permanent. Just pick one and start heading in that direction. You can pivot if you need to later. But the big lesson, never go in against a Sicilian when death is on the line. Oh, wait. No, that's not it. Wait, maybe, it, well, maybe it's this. Never leave your cows alone in a field with aliens. Yup, nailed it. Thanks to Doc G. Make sure you pre-order Doc G's new book, Taking Stock, a hospice doctor's advice on financial independence, building wealth, and living a regret-free life. Pre-order on Amazon or wherever you buy books today. Thanks to Paula Pant for joining us. You'll find her podcast, Afford Anything, wherever you're listening to us right now. Thanks to Len Penzo for joining us. You can find Len at lenpenzo.com slash bovine lover. This show is the property of SP Podcast LLC, copyright 2022, and is written in part by Paulette Perhatch, who helps writers power their words, their work, and their earning potential with her Powerhouse Writers Coaching Program, which starts in August. There are a few spots left, so act now. Well, that's weird. She just told me there was no room for me. Well, anyway, find out more at powerhousewriters.com. Thanks also to our team who made today possible. Brooke Miller is our producer today and our amazing newsletter editor of the 201. Tina Eichenberg and Gertrude Smith are our social media mavens. And Brooke also handles the show notes. Man, she's working hard on this one. Not only should you not take advice from these meatheads, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. That's it for today, folks. We'll see you back here on Monday on Stacking Benjamins.
Welcome to the after show. We're having a party in the comments right now. Chris. Doug. Paulette is. <laughs> <laughs> Paulette, what an amazingly well-written show. <laughs> Doug, all I can say is my name is Inigo Montoya. You kill That's my right. father, prepare to die. Prepare to die. <laughs> By the way, I had a friend tell me that that movie is great. It's obviously a classic, but the book is even better. You know, they always say the book is better. He said, no, 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 the book's not a little better. The book is a lot better. So really? even as good as that movie is. And so we did it. We read it as a family when my kids were maybe eight. We were on a we were on a big, long road trip, and Cheryl actually picked it up at a bookstore and, and read it to all of us. And we read it cover to cover out loud like an audio book. And it's fantastic. There's a whole chapter about him killing Inigo Montoya's dad and the whole chapter goes into, and, and it's, it's a hilarious part of the, of the, did you do the voices though? As you were reading it out loud, did you do all the different? <laughs> no, that's why I only gave Cheryl three stars on audible. I was like, <laughs> no, this is, this is not, not at all, but you know what? Today being the first day that we had a uh, UFO sighting in the United States, right? Wasn't that today's holiday? Something. I don't know. I made that up. I don't know. <laughs> All I know is I won. <laughs> yeah, there's one thing. I missed everything else. We got to stay focused. Uh, but it's a good time for aliens and uh, and ghosts. I mean, I think we got to tell an alien or a ghost story here uh, because of the fact that we're celebrating this uh, amazing holiday. Uh, Len, you've got a ghost story for us, I think. Yeah, secondhand. I was in Vegas with uh, some of my cousins. Uh, two of them were brothers, by the way, and they were staying at a hotel. And I can't remember which hotel it was. Bates. Um, it was Bates, one of the newer Bates, ones. Bates Motel. No, it wasn't the Bates Motel. It, it was on the strip. I can't remember what the heck it was, which one it was. Anyways, um, it was so long. It was probably 12 or 15 years ago. But we had all, you know, it had been a late night and, and uh, we all retired to bed. The, my two cousins, who they were sharing a room. I was in a different room. Um, the next morning at breakfast, they are like, oh, they are, they, they were just truly, they were scared. They independently were awakened at night in the middle of their sleep. They saw a person in a hoodie, he had a hood over his head or her head, I don't know. But this thing, this person or whatever ran in, they saw him run into the bathroom and they both looked at each other and said, did you see that? And they said, and the other one said, yes. And they went in the bathroom and there was nothing there. There was absolutely nothing there. And they, to this day, they are certain they saw some sort of apparition or a ghost. I mean, but it was fully formed and really wild. Wow. You believe in ghosts, Paula? I do not, no. I, I think ghosts are a, a fascinating metaphor for things that are unresolved, yeah, but I don't quite literally believe in them. I think you're wrong. It's okay, yeah. though. Uh, Doc G, how about you? That's interesting, Paula, what you said about a fascinating metaphor for things that are unresolved. I actually now remember, I do have a kind of ghost story. My mom and dad, right when I was born, we moved the whole family because I was born, I was the third of three boys, and they needed more space. So my parents lived in Chicago at the time, and we moved to a suburb of Evanston, and my mom and dad fell in love with the house there. And one of the things especially my dad loved about the house was there was this beautiful tree in the backyard. At some point, they had a, a conversation where they laughed, and, and my dad said, yeah, I, I wouldn't have bought this house except for that tree. It's what makes living here worth it. Wow. And so fast forward eight years later, my father dies unexpectedly. We go on living in that house for four more years. My mom meets my stepdad. They decide to get married. But the problem was my stepdad had two children from a previous marriage, and there were three of us, and they lived at a farther suburb. So this idea was okay, we're getting married, we're bringing the families together, we really need to move to a bigger house. And that bigger house probably shouldn't be in Evanston, it has to be farther north because the other kids went to school farther away. Uh, and this whole thing was disruptive as it was to all of us. And my mom and stepdad had found a house, but my mom was really struggling with taking us out of our childhood house and all the memories and my, my father dying and all those things. And it came to days and days of her struggling and not knowing what to do. And then the next day we got a funny notice. They had been checking the trees in the area and this was an elm tree and it was diagnosed with Dutch elm disease, the tree in our backyard. And they told us it was going to have to come down. 
And in fact, they did cut the tree down and we moved. So if they wouldn't have cut the tree down, you would have stayed? Is that the... I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. That's the wonder of life, right? It was the sign to my mom that it was okay. But that's the thing. That, that we could move and that would be all right. So this wasn't a ghost story so much as it was addressing Paula's comment about explanations for unresolved... Or maybe it was my dad from beyond the grave telling oh, my mom it was okay. That maybe maybe getting remarried and moving and all of that, maybe it was a, a you know... Huh a message from far away huh. that she could move on with her life. That's Paula, cool. you don't believe in ghosts, right? But do you believe in bovine intervention? <laughs> uh... That was bad. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I think that was pretty good, actually. <laughs> that was so bad, it was good. Yeah. Joe, I got, I've got two, if we have time. Holy cow. I've got seven. <laughs> <laughs> let me just let me just tell you mine and then I'll get out of the way and Doug can bring us home. My cousin went to a funeral of one of his best friends who had died in a in a car accident and on the way home from the funeral his uh it's it was him and another friend and all of a sudden all the power went out in their car. The car just died. They pull off to the side of the road. Obviously, they kind of coast to the side of the road, get it out of the road, and just as it coasts to a stop, Everything comes back on and they didn't have the radio on beforehand. The two of them were just talking about their friend who had passed away. And not only when the car starts again, is the radio on, it's blaring their friend's favorite song, the guy who died. Oh, wow. Wow. I know it's pretty hard to ignore some of those things. That's really, it's really crazy. Actually, my first story, Joe, is similar to that. Only in the sense that, so I, I was on a business trip in Milwaukee and there's a famous old hotel there that is allegedly haunted called the Fister Motel. Fister. No, we're not going to, yeah, hotel. we're not going to talk about not that. Motel, that's way fast motel material. That's hotel. Yeah. Did I say motel? You said anyway. motel, the Fister Motel. Oh, it's out on Route 11. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but anyway. This is the cheaper version. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, and it's supposedly haunted. And in the middle of the night, the TV comes on blaring super loud. And it happened to be on, it came on to HBO, which, and I, we got in late. I didn't even watch TV. I went straight to bed and I they didn't even have the TV on earlier. So it's not like I had a channel to choose or anything. And it's almost going where you're hoping it's going, Joe, but it's it's not going there. But it did go on to HBO and there used I thought to be a show. Your, I thought this is your excuse with your wife. You're why like, the porn came I, on? I did not. <laughs> All of a sudden this ghost tunes in a porn channel. No, no idea. but it was close. There was a show on HBO years and years ago called Taxi Cab Confessions and it confessions and it was pretty braunchy. And of course, it comes on blaring right in the middle of a really raunchy section. And there's a guy in the room next to me who I was on the work trip with. And I got grilled about that yeah. one at, in, at the next morning at breakfast. Just so that's a, yeah. yeah, it just happened to come on at four in the morning or whatever it was. So I don't you know, that could have been an electrical problem, but it was in a hotel that is kind of famous for being haunted. And then the second story, though, is a little bit creepier for, for us, but we moved into an older home, not super old, I think it was built in 1941, but after we, we moved in, uh, we got to talking with neighbors, and the people who live right behind us were an older couple. You just kind of over the course of a year or so, we're getting to know them, and we kept inviting them over for, you know, let's have drinks or, you know, let's, let's grill something, and they would never come over. They always made an excuse, and then over the course of that time, I'd found out that the man actually grew up in our house. I think he moved in when he was, you know, 12, 13 years old or something like that. And then found out a little while after that, that his mother had died in the house. And that's why he wouldn't mm. come in the house. Well, set that aside for a second. Since almost the beginning of when we'd moved into the house, it always felt a little bit weird when you'd be in the basement and you'd be walking upstairs. And after that happening a few times, and I just got this weird feeling, I said to my wife, you ever feel like something's watching you when you're going upstairs from the basement? And she said, yeah, actually, I have had that happen a few times. So we get to know our neighbors over the course of the next three or four years. And I, I finally got the gumption up to ask the wife, you know, you told me that your husband's mother died in the house. Any chance anything that was an untimely death. And she said, yeah, she fell down the basement stairs. Mm -hmm. 
we never saw her. We never saw any apparitions or anything like that. But there was just always a feeling and only in that one spot in the house when you were coming up from the basement stairs. That, that's definitely something to ruminate on. <laughs> I don't think we need Paulette anymore. We just got to bring in Len. <laughs> Next show. <laughs> I'm like, and scene. And we're done. That's good. I was going to go back to Paul and say, Paula, come on. Got all this evidence. 